It's pretty rare a player that's ranked in cash cow territory makes the 50 most relevant. It's also pretty rare you're a delisted free agent with history of fantasy and super coach tons and make the 50 most relevant. But with Jeremy Sharp, he ticks all those boxes and plenty more. Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant, having conversations with different members of the Coaches Panel and the fantasy footy community at large about who I think we need to have conversations about for AFL Fantasy, Super Coach and Dream Team and their relevance for our upcoming fantasy footy year. Joining me on this episode, as he has right throughout the 2024 preseason, all of 2023, and still plenty more to come through the 50 most relevant. It's Mini Mike. Mate, good to see you. Talking about another one of your Dockers. I was about to say, we've got another one of these Dockers. Am I having too much influence on you now, MJ? It, there's, a, there's a fair chance we might rebrand this of the 50 most relevant Dockers if we get a little bit lucky, but... It's a fair reason for it, as we've talked through already some Fremantle players, and I think you've got to be a bit of a goose if you're not expecting any more conversations with Mini Monk, let alone around these Fremantle Dockers. Let's dive into the numbers of 2023 and the price points and scoring history of Jeremy Sharp. Nothing at the AFL level last year. No average, no top scores, no tons. Why? He was VFL bound all last year across all of the formats. We didn't get to see him, but there is still some strong history for us there. A 115, a career high ton in Supercoach and a 123 in AFL Fantasy. In that format of AFL Fantasy, he's priced just over $280,000, just a touch over 200K in Dream Team, while in KFC Supercoach, He's right at that basement price of $123,900. Safe to say, if you're under the price point of the number one draft pick last year, which he is in the case of Harley Reid, we put him in the classification of a cash cow. You've spent some time, not just as a free man, a supporter, playing a lot of attention to what he's like now that he's landed at your club, but Mini Monk, given your success and, and years of playing fantasy footy, I think... Anyone that's spent some time really deep diving into clubs and analysis over the past years has looked at a player like Jeremy Sharp and gone, well, there's some fantasy chops here. If he could crack into the side, he's got some fantasy wheels about him. Really nice run, a nice turn of speed. He's always had a, a level of endurance, but has seemingly improved on that, which I do want to talk about in a moment. Good user of the ball runs all day, finds space, a really nice wingman at AFL level, and has also shown even in his junior levels, he can impact through both the half forward and half back flanks. And although he may have been delisted by the Gold Coast Suns last year, he won't be the first or the only player that has been said farewell by a club and then impacts at a new place almost immediately. Absolutely not. And there's plenty of players that have that ability that you know, don't feature on this list. So we need to break down as to why Sharp does fit as the list list. And the reason is there is a very, very clear role for him. There's a reason why Freeway have had hunted him for the last two years. They tried to get a trade across with Gold Coast at the end of the 2022 season. And it came through unsuccessfully because Freeway had a lot of other chips on their table, as did Gold Coast. And then he doesn't play for the entirety of the 2023 season. He's re relegated to the VFL for the entire year. And you get him from a delisted free agent. So Fremantle must be saying, fine, we waited a year. We didn't lose any draft capital. We've got a player that we wanted to bring into the club. We've now got a clear role for him after the departure of Liam Henry. It's a pretty clear lay down. Like he is training on the wing. He has got the gut running ability that the club has wanted him to come in for. It's a very easy fit. And the other part is, as you mentioned, he has the scoring chops. We've already seen it at AFL level. And then because of the fact that he barely played in 2022 and then didn't play in 2023, he comes in at a price which is just too hard to miss. Like it's rookie priced. For someone who has averaged 70 across, you know, a 10 game sample size in 2021 in AFL and DT and 65 in super coach, you think, all right, that's great. It's rookie scores, if he's rookie priced, that'll get him to, you know, 450, 500K. What's lost in that is that the last game he played in that season, he was the sub. He came on for a six in AF and a three in Supercoach. 
<laughs> you take that number out, it's closer to an 80 and a 75. So you're thinking, right, well, if you can go 80 and 75, great. Maybe you get to the 500K marker. But what if I tell you that there's a hundred back to back in AF mm -hmm. and a 115 into a 96 in Supercoach? That is how you spike your scores. That is how you spike your price. We've seen rookies that have been able to do that. Last year, Kay Chandler, bang, massive score round one, 114 AF, 110 super coach, was the rookie to have in round one aside from Harry Sheasel. And then round two, bang, another 90 in AF and an 80 odd in super coach. His price takes off. Hmm. So if Sharp can do anything like that, which is well within his wheelhouse at AFL level already, that is why he's in the 50. That is why he is at this point. And that is why he is so relevant to our starting squads in AFL Fantasy Dream Team and Super Coach in 2024. A thousand percent. Like those games that you mentioned, the round 18 and round 19, there's 30 plus possessions in both of those games, a 10 mark and a nine mark game. One of those, he kicks a goal as well. But these aren't the only good scores from that season. Just a few weeks earlier in round 15, 20 possessions, eight marks, and he goes mid 70s. Uh, round 21. Nine marks, 19 possessions, 88 in AFL Fantasy, 71 in Supercoach. And again, you're going, boys, you're talking about 80s and 70s and he's got this low hundreds. Remember, this is at a cash cow level. He has four years experience on an AFL list. And then last year, sure, relegated to the VFL. Do you want to go through his data numbers there? Sure. Dozens of 25 and 30 plus possession games. Dozens. You want to look at the marks, Tatley. Multiple, multiple, multiple. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Multiple games where he's getting that. Is he impacting the scoreboard? Yeah. Multiple games where he's converting and impacting goals, let alone getting score involvements. Is that translating to fantasy footy scores? You bet it is. Multiple tons and some big ones, including in AFL fantasy. There's a 150 plus in the mix of that as well and consistent 100-plus scores in Supercoach. So we've got a guy who at the lower level of VFL has shown he can score. A guy that at AFL level, yeah, he's only had 23-odd games of football, and a handful of them have been sub-impacted. It's probably more than a handful if you want to be really honest. He's delivered tons, he's delivered 90s, and he's shown that he can score. I want to ask you a couple of questions, Mini Monk, not just because you're the Fremantle fan of the coaches panel, but while we are looking at this Fremantle element, and then there's a few other uh, kind of threads I want to pull with you that are kind of broad from that. He's come as a delisted free agent. Historically, we don't take that as confidence. I know you've mentioned the club tried to get him. I guess out and out, the first question people want to know is, is he best 22? first and foremost. Next would be, what's his sub-risk based on what we've seen historically at Gold Coast? And then third, since landing at the club with day one of being able to be signed as a delisted free agent, how has he landed at the club? I know I've just given you three big questions, but talk us through those three things because I think they're really, really important to unpack. Sure. If we, if we start about his best 22, it's quite high. Like Frio don't have a lot of out and out genuine wingers. And you pick my point is that, well, you've got O'Driscoll, you've got Aish, you've got Chapman who could play on the wing. People have talked about players like Frederick or even someone like Walker pushing up onto a wing. I don't see it. If you're playing at Optus for, you know, 12 out of your 23 games of a season, you need someone who has a tank and a huge one because it's a big ground. It's a wide ground. It's almost, it's basically as big as the MCG is. And in summer, it's going to be 30 odd degrees on some games there. You know, round round four, round five, round six, even up to round 10, you can get 20 odd degree days. It's very hot. So you need someone that can actually, you know, cop with the heat, run 16 Ks and still be able to run at the end of the game and not cramp up. And Sharp's the type of player who can do that. So that's where it comes into the next part, which is the sub risk. He's got the best running capacity of anyone at the club already. Like all of the reports that are coming from Trap Watchers, they're saying they're doing multiple 2K time trials. Sharp leads every single one, and he's the only one left standing as the as the time trial ends. Like he's the one who's taking an air, who's taking a sip of water. Everyone else has passed out on the floor, and he's just standing there and being like, "All right, what's next? I'm done with my warm up. What have you got for me?" So no, there's no sub risk. He's not the type of player that would be a sub because you don't sub the wingers that have got the tank to be able to run out a game. 
Like, unless he gets injured or concussed or whatever, I don't see him being subbed. It's very different conditions to what you get on the Gold Coast where it can be muggy and dewy and you might want to change something because some rain's come in. In in, in Odpa Stadium, it's just not going to happen. And then the third part, you know, we're, we're worried about, you know, what's he going to be? What, what, what can he actually do for him? And like, you know, I think we've talked through his numbers. I think there's enough there to know that he can actually play the game. I think we're pretty safe in going with him. Not quite sure exactly what your third question was because I've talked for so long, but if you could just give me a hint back towards it, I think it would be good. <laughs> uh, you've talked about how he's landed at the club and is he best 22 um, as yeah. well and that that delisted free agent. I feel like we've covered the the demystifying of that. Just think of a, it's a different one, but a Ben Keys in Adelaide, for example. Yeah. It has come straight in and has impacted. And it was more to do with the type of players that already existed at the prior club and on the list then it might be able to do with anyone's perceived value um, yeah. of, of what he is. And, and, also, and also the circumstances. Like on the Gold Coast, you don't need your outside players quite as much because if you get into the slop, if you get into the dew, what are you going to want to do? You want to try and just gun the ball down the middle. You want to try and get from one end to the other as fast as you can. That's why we see a lot of play through the middle. That's why you see a lot of the contested players get a lot of tackles. You're thinking Rao, you're thinking Miller. And if you're playing through the center, you're playing through someone like Anderson or Swallow instead. And that's why someone like Sharp didn't really come into their best 22 calculations. You get it. It's fine. It means he's a good fit at Fremantle where he lands for free, essentially. We talked a little bit during the 50 Most Relevant. We've already had some Fremantle conversations. I remember we talked about Heath Chapman. And on that episode, there are a number of things that were drawn out. One, you've already re-reminded us around about how important it is to if these players at these lower price points can stack score upon score, they can move in an AFL fantasy space, six figures over a fortnight. Mm. If it's strong enough, they can go 50 to 80,000. Once these scores start rolling through to 150,000 in super coach and dream team really, really fast, depending how these scores start to roll through. One of the best ways that happens is through maximizing fixtures, both, on opposition and also through where they play. Because when you see a Jeremy Sharp score well, it's not, it should come of no surprise. A wingman and an outside player marks an uncontested possessions. These are the two narratives and pathways where you want to see him boost up his scoring to move from not just a 60 or a 70 or an 80. You want to see that 110 game, that 120 AF game that we've seen in his uh, second or third season, let alone what he's done at VFL level, uncontested marks and possessions are the way to get there. So on that, you've talked about this ground that's beautifully set for him. And of all places, the weather is probably the best in Perth uh, from a football perspective through the months yeah, of March, arguably. April, May, June, arguably. Um, so talk to me about the fixture, both opponents and locations of these, and are these favourable in Sharp? I'm going to bring in one more factor to those two factors Please. you've already talked about, and that is actually the early buys. And I, and I hinted on this on the Chapman episode, and I'm going to repeat it here. The scores that you can get from rookies in rounds two, three, five, and six, where you have those multi-buy rounds where it is best 18, if you can get a rookie that pops a score that's above 80, be it even a 90 or an 85 or whatever, that can save you a lot from a poor premium score, from a, a dud mid price score. And if you've got someone that can go 110, 120 in one of those rounds as a rookie, that could bump a premium score off or a mid price score off. You know, you could be dropping a 90 score in one of those weeks if you're lucky. That is huge. And someone like Jeremy Sharp has already shown that he can do that at AFL level. He's done it twice in back-to-back -back weeks. That's pretty gold. But then you lie it in with the fixtures and the grounds that he has. So round one, Lions at Optus. Okay? Round two, first multi bow round, North Melbourne at Marvel Stadium. Under the roof. Beautiful. Adelaide at Optus Stadium in round three. Fine. Carlton, round four, Adelaide Oval, fine. Uh, Port Adelaide, round five at Adelaide Oval, good ground, tougher fixture, but that's okay. You can kind of live with one rough fixture for your, for your player. But then we get to the juicy run from round six to round 10. And this is the same point I made with here, Chapman. It's West Coast, Western Bulldogs, Richmond, Sydney, and St. Kilda. And you know the best part? Doesn't have to play at the SCG. Doesn't have to play at Mars Stadium. Doesn't have to play at any of these really weird grounds that are small. It's Optus, Optus, MCG, Optus, Marvel. Big grounds, open space, perfect for a winger. 
there's every chance by round 10 by saying, right, this guy has made us, you know, 400 K he's at the high 600 K marker. He's done his job. Let's flick him off. No need to hold him to his buy. He's maxed out. Beautiful. You're away. Mm. That's what I can see happening because you look at that, the dogs, Richmond and St. Kilda in three weeks out of four, we know how well halfbacks wingers can score in those uncontested type games against those teams. And if he goes, you know, 80 plus in three out of those four games, beautiful. He will be 600K and oh, it's 600K in AF and you have 400K odd in super coach. Yeah. It's such an easy upgrade at that point to the premium that you want to grab. It's such an easy fix for whatever you want to do for your buy structure or where you want to grab your line. Just, it's just don't overthink it. Really don't overthink it. We, we do that so often in the preseason. And sometimes I was chatting with one of our Patreons just a little while ago. Again, if you're not a Patreon for as little as a couple of dollars a month, you can support the coach's panel and get access to a bunch of other tier rewards. And they were saying, I've got this friend who basically only looks at fantasy football once the preseason games are done. And his starting squads are just as good as mine. And I'm like, well, there's a number of reasons for it. One is the amount of information that exists mm-hmm. and how many great content creators that are. That, so now, okay, it's easy to find information. I said, but the second is you're just overthinking so much. You're, you're spinning through the hypotheticals of what happens if and what happens if. And sometimes we can talk ourselves out of a player that we were really bullish on when the format opened, when the team pickers of Dream Team and Supercoach came out and then, we showed it on a forum. We told a mate about it. We screenshotted it to us. And then all of a sudden, someone on social media is like, why have you got them? And you start the doubt narrative. Sharp to me feels like one of the easiest selections for us, um, unless he's not named round one. Obviously, you don't pick him then, but I don't see that yeah. pathway of where he's not if he's fit and healthy. I'm very much in agreement with you. Uh, mini monk about his role and his security in that side and so why is he in the 50 most relevant and not other cash cows to this point why is this the first cash cow we've brought in really easy for you and under the price point of a cash cow which again we're seeing is harley reed and under how many can you tell me have multiple afl fantasy tons at the afl level how many have got multiple 90 plus scores and 100 in super coach? Where are we so confident? Why is he so relevant in contrast to a bunch of others? He's done it at the AFL level. Others have done it at VFL, Waffles, Sandful, under 18s, and we're forecasting and expecting, and maybe they do deliver that. But with Sharp, it is known, it is proven, it's not hypothetical. This guy can score, and as Mini Monk has beautifully walked us through, he's done it at AFL level, and he's at a club that I don't think you would have asked Mini Monk to be at a better club at all. No, I, I think if you if you're looking for a player to score well on the outside, there's a few other clubs that probably can score in a comparable sense. But you only have to look back to last year. Look at the scores that Liam Henry had at the back half of 2023. He was in consideration for people to trade into as a potential mid prices slash underpriced premium late in the season as well. And he started going 100s in AF and high 90s in, in Supercoach. And if you're telling me there's a player that you can get for under 300,000 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team and under 200,000 in Supercoach that could just slot straight into that role, has a better tank than Liam Henry, not quite the same player, but definitely has a better aerobic capacity to him that could just pick up those points straight away. Even if he's 10 points, 15 points less than that, he's still going to make so much coin. It's just a great landing spot for us as fantasy coaches. And it's a great landing spot for him as a player. He's one of these guys that classic owners and salary cap coaches are really increasing their volume and how bullish and excited they are around him. Whereas the draft community, again, it depends on the amount of coaches, depends about your squad depth, depends about how many players you need to go and land on field. All those variables ultimately determine a player's draft relevancy as opposed to salary cap. But to me, Mini Monk, I look at a draft and I go, man, if depending on the size of the league, man, a late flyer as a guy that given that early fixture that you gave me, given those early rounds where if you are playing through those early buys with best 18 and trying to maximize scoring with on-field options, I'm really happy to just take a late punt on him in drafts, have him there. And then if he's not delivering, 
drop him like a high school crush. Just absolutely move on during the multi-buy rounds or after you get through those early best 18 six-round block and just move him on because he's done his job. I don't see anyone being super bullish on him in draft leagues. Keepers and dynasties, sure, it's a different story. But are you bullish on him for drafts or do you have him at that back end as well? No, I think if he gets to, say, a 75 average in AF and a 70 average in Supercoach, I think that's a fairly land, fairly conservative landing spot. I think that that's probably where he ends up. And if he does that, he doesn't really sit as an M5 on field for you anyway. So you're probably not wanting to be fielding that unless you get a spike score or a good matchup. He has a few of those early, as you highlighted. Could take a fly, try and loop him on for a few games as well. But he's not a player who's drive relevant. We know No, this. He's very he, classic He's really relevant. not. Yeah, if if you do have him in draft, it, for me, it's that early six weeks during the early yeah. buy blocks, grab him and then flip him and hope to get an asset that season long is, is going yeah, to get exactly. you there. I, I agree. He's a, he's a classic and a salary cap player of relevance. Draft, maybe not so much. Hey, Mini Mark, it's been a pleasure to have you on yet again, talking about one of your brand new Dockers. Yeah, good to be back on. And I wonder how many Dockers there are still to come. Well, you'd think there's at least a couple more. If you look through who scored well in 2023, yeah. if you look through the ownership percentages, if you look along the chatter and maybe even just look at who's in your team right now, it's a fairly good chance that not only will Mini Monk appear in the 50 most relevant yet again, but he'd probably be talking about another Docker. If you want to go read the article that sits alongside this episode, it's available for you now at coachespanel.tv. If you're listening to this podcast, make sure you've subscribed and uh, you'll get audio podcasts right from us all throughout the preseason during the 50 most relevant. They're dropping every single day, but soon the strategy episodes start to land with different members of the panel, unpacking different fantasy formats and looking at a bunch of nuances. While you're there, you can leave a five-star rating and review. That's what Neil Boss has done. Here's the deal. If you leave a five-star rating and review and a comment, especially on Apple Podcasts, we might even breed it out during a 50 most relevant. So Neil Boss said this, it's an epic AFL fantasy podcast. So many interesting and new strategies discussed. Really enjoying the 2024 preseason so far. Keep up the great work. Well, Neil Boss, thank you for keeping up your great work. If you'd like to get a shout out during a podcast, you can do that by either leaving a five-star rating and review or becoming a Patreon member for as little as $2 a month, right up to our premium tier. You can support the coaches panel, get access to some hidden groups, additional content in season and out of season stuff, including Sam. He just signed up in the past day or two at that premium tier level. If you'd love to become a supporter of the coaches panel, the details to become part of our Patreon are in the description of this episode. So who's next in the 50 most relevant it's a good question we're done with the 30s now so who's kicking us off let's give you a little bit of a clue for the past four seasons i'd classify this guy as a premium defender for the past four seasons if you look at his super coach and afl fantasy numbers he's been as consistent as you like week upon week year upon year he finds a way to sit in that top 10 era of defenders. But as I look through the preseason this year and we start to hypothesize who might take it to not just a top 10 defensive ability, but who could get to triple figures? Who's done triple figures before? I'll tell you this. He's never done it for a season yet, but he's got mighty close. And after four years of consistent performances across Supercoach, Dream Team, and AFL Fantasy in our back line, is there enough change either in our back lines, in the team that he plays for, or in the way we view fantasy that maybe tells us this guy is getting slept on in the community? Who's this premium defender we're going to talk about? You'll find out tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.